Hi, this is the Crazy Monkey New Mexico podcast, and this is your host, as always, Nathan Wagar. Today we're going to be talking about something of a hallowed topic within the martial arts world, and that's the idea of striking vital targets and pressure points. And I'm going to be approaching it from the standpoint of someone with experience in the traditional martial arts, so don't forget that brown belt and kempo, as well as a licensed massage therapist therapist and I'm also uh, certified in myoskeletal alignment under Eric Dalton and then I'm going to move into kind of the tarmac approach to striking vital points okay so hold up just a second time for that sip (sighs) all right Irish coffee so I remember when I was doing Kempo back in the day and we would have the anatomical uh, pressure point chart up on the wall. It'd be the acupressure chart. There's like, I can't remember offhand, but I think it was something like 370 or I could be off on that number, but 300 plus uh, pressure points. And they would follow certain meridians and certain meridians would affect certain body parts and uh, organs as long as they were stimulated at certain times of the day. And we would spend literally hours memorizing those points and those times. And I remember three points was a knockout. Uh, Five points was death. Didn't matter where they were on the body as long as you hit those five points in quick succession. And the person would die. It was kind of (laughs) like, it was kind of like Kill Bill. You know, the five point exploding heart palm technique. Um... He would take no more than five steps and die. And if you doubt this, you know, read the manuals. They're out there. They've even got the little cool guy Chinese drawings and everything. But I I remember memorizing, uh, what was it, the triple warmer just behind the uh, the mastoid, kind of that mastoid process behind the uh, angle of the jaw. And you would go forward and out the mouth at a 45-degree angle, and that was a knockout. Uh, FYI, it's not. It just hurts a lot. But um, I memorized all this stuff. And I will tell you right now, don't. Because that stuff doesn't work. It, it straight up doesn't. And an unfortunate part of, uh, and an unfortunate fact is that a lot of law enforcement uh, c- kind of uh, arrest and control techniques use the idea of pressure points to help make the wrist lock uh, more effective on a non-compliant suspect. And here's the problem. First off, hold up, one more sip. Okay. The first thing to note is that if you have to memorize stuff, you're not going to do it. That goes for techniques as well as places to hit. It's just not going to happen. You have to access a gross motor skill set under high stress. Okay. And um, the other thing to keep in mind is that these points, the vast, vast majority of them, are not going to have any effect whatsoever on a person that's experiencing the adrenal response. So what does that mean for you? You're going to be spending a lot of time getting hit, stabbed, shot, whatever, Trying to remember, you know, where the exploding heart palm technique sequence is and all that. And don't forget to hit it at the right angle, right? So, that stuff just doesn't work. Um, now, I will caveat this, okay? Acupuncture with the needles, I do believe, has some health benefits. And from what I understand, the latest studies on that determine that there is a 90% uh, positive rate of positive symptoms and increase in positive symptoms and uh that that shouldn't be that shouldn't be naysayed because these are these are, this is medical western research that it's determined this that there are some positive benefits by using acupuncture but acupressure no why because it's not uh, precise enough and that should tell you something right there because if it has to be a needle to make it work well, what are you doing when you hit it? Even if it's with your little index finger that you've been, you know, doing your iron palm training on and all that. 
it's uh, it's not going to happen. And there is, it should be pointed out that about, if I remember correctly, is roughly 70 plus percent of those acupressure points share commonality with known trigger point sites. And trigger points are kind of uh, areas of, uh, I don't really know how to explain this. It's kind of like a congested nerve site. It's um, basically the way you release a trigger point is you're going to press directly on it for 12 to 15 seconds. Some people like to do a one-directional stroke, kind of two seconds each time, one, two, one, two, one, two, until it subsides. Usually it takes about 12 to 15 seconds. So if you ever find a point when you press on it and it's tender and the pain refers, so that means like if it's in your arm and you press it and you feel it all the way up your shoulder, that's a trigger point. Um, most acupressure points... So 70 plus percent share commonality with known trigger points in Western medicine. And so that probably has great bearing on the fact that there's such a high success rate with acupuncture, right? Because whether or not the Eastern theory is correct, the fact is is the Western theory on certain aspects of it does coincide with the known points. But here's the thing. They're very precise points and they are not debilitating. And you can watch, you know, you can go on YouTube and you can watch videos of these uh, knockout masters doing their thing with non-compliant people from other gyms and it doesn't work. That's just how the, uh, that's how it goes. So that's the first problem is the first problem is it's, it's not, it, ha- it needs to be access under stress. You're not going to remember the charts. And the second thing is. It's not going to work on somebody that's uh, experiencing the adrenal response. So how does Tarmac approach this idea of remembering all these points and vital strikes? Because there's a lot of good stuff. And I want to stress that I'm not saying that you shouldn't ever hit these different points. And what I mean by that is some people, you know, they like to attack the ankles, the knees. There's tender points on the thigh. There's the brachial complex. There's, um, you know, you can get a flash knockout by hitting the brachial complex. There's different areas on the throat, the chin. There's a sweet spot behind the ear. Yes, I understand that. There's even some places in the shoulder where you can give them a dead arm. And there's the median nerve on the inside of the biceps. And there's a lot of good stuff. But I'm not, I'm not saying I'm not saying that you should get rid of it. But what I am saying is that you should save that for a more advanced practitioner. In the beginning, I teach what's called target zones. And how is this different? Well, the difference is, is I find areas of the body that's a broad, it's a zone. And it consists of, it's sort of what you would call a target-rich environment in the military. So it's a zone of a bunch of smaller points. And it's so target-rich that if you hit it, you're going to hit something that's going to hurt and cause some issues. And it's much easier to hit under duress because it's bigger. And it's pretty much a you can't miss. And the the second thing that I really like about it is in tarmac, we're always stressing what's called an escalation of force. So you need to have options for the lesser threats as well as lethal options for the high threats. So here are the three target zones and I'm going to discuss them from lowest to highest. The lowest threat target zone is you're going to draw a mental line at the opponent's hips, and then you're going to draw another mental line at the opponent's knees. You're going to cut that line in half, and anywhere on that line, that horizontal line around the thigh, is going to hurt if you knee it. And make sure when you throw that knee that you bring your foot all the way back to your butt as you throw the knee so that the muscle on the inside part of that knee is going to pop out and strike. Do not hit them with your kneecap or your knee will blow up to the size of a softball. Trust me, I did that to a kid in basic back when I was in basic training many moons ago. And uh, he tried to wake me up for fire guard and I need him in the head. It was a long, long story. But point being, um, I was the loser of that altercation. <laughs> all right, taking a sip. Cool. 
Now, that's good if your buddy or whatever, you, you have him in a nice underhook position, a nice clinch, and you just, you just decide to slam some knees into him or just to cause some pain. And you can drop somebody with a good knee shot. But the problem is that with a conditioned opponent, someone that does Muay Thai, you're going to knee him in the, the thigh, and he's just going to kind of stare at you. So keep that in mind. But this is good for a low threat. And anywhere on that line, as long as you're hitting at the halfway mark, draw a line from the hip, and then draw another line at the knee, and cut that line in half, and anywhere on that horizontal line, it's going to hurt. Okay, now... The, uh, I guess we'll call it a medium threat because it's not going to kill him, but it can drop him. And I use this anytime I strike the body. A lot of people like to strike the floating ribs, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's an excellent target. But I like to, I like to do what I, I like to hit what I call the, uh, the fertile crescent. Yes. Imagery. And the Fertile Crescent is basically, if you're looking at the human body from the front, you're going to look at that line. And this is a good rule. Anywhere on the body where hard meets soft. So it's right at the bottom of the rib cage along that curve of the diaphragm. So if you're looking at it on your left, the opponent's right, it's going to be just under his... Uh, pectoral muscle okay and it's going to curve around the top where the solar plexus is and then it's going to curve down the other side along and underneath the other pectoral muscle and this uh this extends onto the back too it's a little bit higher on the back but it's where hard meets soft it's along that curve where the rib cage meets the uh the abdomen area and on the front, the reason why I like this is because there's so much stuff. There's a solar plexus. There is the diaphragm muscle, which when struck will tighten up around the lungs and that knocks the wind out of you. If you're looking at it, as you look at it, on the left side is the liver. And it extends below the rib cage. even. It's a very, very large organ. And then on the right is the spleen, but it's hidden by the rib cage. But you've got a lot of good stuff. And if you're looking at that fertile crescent, the left side as you're looking at it is probably the best because that's where the liver is. So I like to hit from center to left. That's just me personally. And it extends down to the floating ribs too. So there's so much good stuff there to hit. You can break the tip of the siphoid process of the sternum. So there's a structural element to it of hitting the cartilage. There's a solar plexus and even... Uh, a part of the vagus nerve extends down there so you can knock the wind out and stun them. The diaphragm, the liver, there's a lot of good stuff there as long as you hit that crescent. And it, it's more frontally located than people think. So a lot of people are always trying to hit people on the side of their body with, a, like, say, a shovel hook. And what they're actually doing is they, they end up catching the, the tip of the hip, you know, the top of the iliac crest, the hip bone. And it hurts their hands. And the same thing when they try to hit the kidneys on the back. And so if you follow that where hard meets soft rule, you're going to make sure that if you do hit the back, you know, you're going for the kidneys on the back side, you're going to be hitting the kidneys and not the hip bone. And so where hard meets soft, that's usually where a lot of juicy anatomical goodness is. And that's where you want to be striking. So the fertile crescent, that's where I like to go when I'm hitting the body. And that's for those medium threats. It's going to hurt them. It's going to cause some damage. You're going to hit some organs and some nerve plexus, affect his respiratory system, or respiratory. <laughs> and it's just a good kind of a medium threat thing where you want to hurt him and you want to cause some damage, but you don't want to kill him. And the final zone is the highest one. You notice also that this escalation of force target zones goes from low to high threat, and it actually is low at the legs to high. The high threat is the neck. And the reason I like to throw at the neck is because, and, and it, this is vastly kind of, uh, people stress this too much that you can break your hand. I would argue it's because most of them don't know how to throw a, 
They don't know how to throw a proper punch. And it's not what people think about rolling the knuckles in. It's how you hold your wrist. But we'll get, in, we'll get into that on another podcast. But there is a danger of damaging your hand. I promise it's not going to cause an issue in the moment. But for guys like law enforcement, military, where their trigger finger is their lifeline, or if you're facing multiple opponents, or you need to keep going after this altercation, it's a good thing to kind of preserve your hands as much as you can. And I do sympathize with that view. So the neck is where you go. All the boxing stays the same. It's just you go for the neck. Now be careful of the front. The front of the throat can kill him because it will crush the larynx. And unless you can do a tracheotomy and doing it with a pen, yeah, good luck on that. But unless you can do that, he's going to die. And it's going to be very painful. And he's probably going to drown on his own blood in front of you. So make sure it warrants that. huh? Uh, But you got the larynx in the front. You have the carotid arteries, the uh, vagus nerves, the jugular veins on the side. You've got the brachial complex. Um, You've got all these sweet spots. And then on the back of the neck, you have those areas right underneath the occipitals. That's actually where we aim to throw our hooks. So that if the person tries to pull back, we'll still hit him in the jaw. And you can include, if you want a frontal target that won't kill him, you can include the chin and the jaw. That's, uh, there's nothing wrong with that, but for the most part, the neck is a, it should be considered a very high threat. So if you're say a female or a smaller male, like I am, um, and you're fighting a really huge dude, neck, neck all day long. Okay. Um, just be careful with this one guys. And those are, those are kind of the targets that I like. So we've got three, three basic zones. It's very target rich within those zones and it's good for the newer guy that's getting used to hitting uh, target areas. Now, as you get more advanced, there's other target areas that you could hit. So let's take the leg. Um, Or no, let's, let's look at this a bit differently. Let's go for what I like to call kind of the, uh, the quick kill targets. Hold up, taking a sip. Quick kill targets are kind of what I would teach soldiers. And not much changes, except for a few quick things, because I'll I'll get into that. So I've got the ankles. If you're looking at the front, I go for the ankles. Why? Because there's less play there than the knees, and they're smaller, and I want targets I can go for that are going to work even for a little guy. So I like the ankles. Uh, A favorite move I have is to actually inclinch, especially step on the feet with my foot outward at a 90 degree angle and slam into him and keep my weight on the foot when he lands. So I like to attack the feet right at the ankle. Uh, With the knee, there's a little bit more play and flexibility in the knee. And with big guys or if your shoe slips when you kick, you know, it's, uh, it's not as easy as everybody thinks, but with the ankle, it's a pretty solid shot. I When I'm attacking the leg, I don't like the midline rule because some guys are conditioned. I actually prefer hitting what's called the hip pointer. And for those of you that know illegal shots in football, the hip pointer sucks. It'll drop a guy. Uh, it's where the psoas muscle is located, and on... Um, In massage therapy, I could bring 300-pound dude up off the table if I applied too much pressure too fast to that psoas. It is is a rough, tender spot. And the way you find it is if you're standing, you kind of have to be standing for this. You're going to feel for two spots at your hip. One is the point of your hip bone with your thumb. So you have your palm down. Or sorry, you have your uh, palm inward on your side. You're going to raise your hand with your thumb, and you're going to touch the, the point of your hip. And then with your index finger, you're going to find that bone on the outward side. It's kind of like a round bone. It's that trochanter of your femur. Okay, anywhere upward and inward of that trochanter, and just below the, uh, the, the top crest of your hip bone, it's going to make kind of a triangle in the front. If you, if you, that's why I like uh, forward knees because it hits this spot. And you can hit the spot 
around the trochanter as well, but I like that front part the best. If you throw a knee to that spot, you can drop a guy if you hit it. And unlike the midline, you can't condition it. And the reason being is it's the connective tissue. And so, in fact, the more athletic they are, the worse it is for them. It actually causes more pain, and it can pretty much cripple that leg. It's not... It's not going to cause any permanent damage, but it, it can drop a guy. I would argue a lot more effectively than the midline. And it's it's a little bit harder to hit, so it's, an, it's a more advanced target, I would say. But it's a more reliable target overall than following the midline rule. So we've got the ankles. We've got those points, the uh, hip pointer area. We've got... Uh, I like the fertile crescent, but I like to stick with the left side because it's where the liver is, and you can drop a guy with that. And we've got the neck. So not too much different from the typical one. Now, if I get the back, there's only three areas I want, and the kidneys aren't one of them. Because once I've got the back, I want to end this. I'm not going to waste time with a body shot. Because the kidneys aren't going to drop a guy get like a good liver shot. So when I get the back, I'm looking at three spots. I'm looking at the ankles. I'm looking at the back of the neck, or you could go around the front for a choke or whatever, and I'm looking for the tailbone. Everybody forgets about the tailbone, but if I have a good grip and I knee in the tailbone, that tip will break pretty easy. You're not going to walk for six months. Okay, so those are the spots that I like that are kind of what I call quick kills. They're easy, and they're fast, and they get an immediate response. Um, let's, let's talk about two areas that I haven't mentioned and I haven't mentioned them on purpose and everybody always asks about this and that is the eyes and the groin. This is why I don't name the eyes or the groin because they are the most reflexively guarded points Some of the most reflexively guarded points in the human body. And the reason why is because the groin is how we reproduce. And the eyes, we are visual creatures. A great majority of our brain, of all the senses, is devoted to our, uh, our eyes and our visual sense. So those are the most reflexively guarded, both instinctually and by societal conditioning. Everybody knows to go for the eyes and the groin. And so our body has an extremely acute kind of reflexive response to guard that, whether with a kind of a fetal position to protect that groin or you're going to blink. And I've had people try to gouge my eyes in jujitsu, just guys that came into the gym and were jerks or dudes that were doing it on accident. And I'm telling you right now, it's not as easy as people think. Now, you can get in a good solid position and gouge the eyes. Yes, you can. But just as a strike... It's not a go-to for me. And here's the other thing that a lot of people don't think about. If I drop you or I break your ankle or your tailbone or I hit the neck and it's a knockout, that will knock you out. The neck will knock you out if you strike it. Unlike all the other knockout shots, the neck's a winner. At the very least, you're going to get a stun, possibly a flash knockout where he kind of knocks out on his feet and then he kind of comes to and he's groggy. But the eyes... Let's say you got poked in the eyes. You can't see, but that doesn't mean that he's going to stop. Let's say he had a knife, and I've seen some guys teach this, to go for the eyes as a strike to actually cause damage. That's cool, but what if he keeps slashing and going forward? What if you can't make it around him? It doesn't stop the action immediately, and that's really what self-defense is about. It's about stopping the violent action. It's not just about causing damage. So... For those reasons, the eyes and the groin, I'm not saying you can't go for them. If it's there, take it. But don't make it the end-all and be-all. So remember those three target zones? I like the ankles, I like the fertile crescent, and I like the neck. And then as you get more advanced, you know, there's the quick kill ones. There's, um, there's more advanced ways to attack the leg. I talked about one of them, but there's a lot more. And <laughs> I actually learned them from massage therapy, kind of where the most tender areas on the leg are. But uh, that hit pointer is a winner. And so these kind of targets can incapacitate somebody. And they have many little targets. And as long as you hit them and train to hit those spots, 
you're going to hit something. And that's kind of the approach I take it for, uh, for Tarmac. It also gives your client kind of a beginner level escalation of force too. So he has an idea of what's going to cause severe damage and what's going to cause minimal damage. And he can kind of approach the situation he's dealing with in an appropriate manner. And so uh, those are my thoughts, guys. Um, I hope you learned something. Uh, take care and have, uh, have a great night.